Hello, everyone, and welcome to worship here at St. Paul's. Nice to have you with us. Now, perhaps you might be wondering, why on earth am I in my office today as opposed to the church? Well, I'm actually recording this on Monday because our recording device, uh, we experienced some technical difficulties with it, unfortunately. And it's a huge bummer because we had a lot of exciting things happen at St. Paul's this past week here in worship. On Thursday nights, we uh, had our entire school sing a special song of praise to the Lord, and it was also our eighth grade graduation. And on Sunday, we welcomed another member into God's family through the sacrament of holy baptism. And on both Thursday and Sunday, we celebrated the festival of Pentecost, the day when our Lord gave his promised Holy Spirit to the apostles, and they were given amazing spiritual gifts so that they were able to proclaim the gospel with courage all around the world. Uh, Pentecost is really viewed as the birthday of the Christian church. And so with all that being said, it's a huge bummer that we weren't able to record either one of those services this week. But I wanted to make it up to you. And so what we'll do today is this. Um, I will, sh I will uh, share with you uh, the prayer of the day, uh, and then all of the readings that we had for the Festival of Pentecost, uh, with the sermon included, uh, we'll then join together in the prayer of the church, as well as the Lord's Prayer, and then we'll depart with the Lord's Blessing. Uh, so that's how we'll handle things this week as we commemorate the Festival of Pentecost. And I'll just bring up my screen real quick so that you can uh, follow along. All right, let us pray. Holy Spirit, God and Lord, come to us this joyful day with your sevenfold gift of grace. Rekindle in our hearts the holy fire of your love, that in a true and living faith we may tell abroad the glory of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Father, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading today is from Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. One of the amazing things that the Holy Spirit enabled the apostles to do was to preach the gospel in different languages. And the reason that was so necessary was because of the events at the Tower of Babel. And those events, unfortunately, are not so great. And we'll talk about why that is in just a moment, because uh, Genesis 11, verses 1 through 9, is not only our first lesson, but it will also serve as the basis for the sermon today. So we hear Genesis 11. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come. Let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from over the face of the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson comes to us from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. Here we see the events of that first Pentecost, the, the, the day when the apostles received the Holy Spirit, and we see the birth of the Christian church. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, 
because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How then is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this was what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We now hear the Holy Gospel recorded for us in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 14, verses 23 through 27. Here we see Jesus get, promising his disciples the gift of the Holy Spirit. And of course, that promise would be fulfilled on Pentecost. Uh, Pentecost, by the way, happened 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, 10 days after Jesus ascended back into heaven. Um, this lesson here, uh, Jesus is speaking to his apostles on Monday, Thursday, the day before Jesus' suffering and death. So in uh, about a month and a half, uh, this promise of Jesus would be fulfilled. So we hear that promise now. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We'll now spend a few moments uh, focusing on our first lesson uh, from Genesis chapter 11, where we hear about the tragic events uh, that happened at the Tower of Babel. Uh, but at the same time, we're also going to focus on the unity that we have in the Gospel. So that'll be the focus uh, for today, again, as we continue our celebration of Pentecost. I do want to ask you a question. Do you know how many spoken languages exist in the world today? Go ahead, take a guess, but don't Google it. Don't cheat. Do you have a guess? Well, I looked it up, and there are a, approximately 7,000 100 spoken languages in the world today. That's kind of a lot, isn't it? And so it's no wonder why we have students in school learning foreign languages as part of their curriculum. They have to learn foreign languages because odds are they're going to have to put those skills into practice eventually. Now, of course, learning foreign languages, while it could be fun, it also complicates things quite a bit. Uh, the language barrier uh, definitely prohibits 
communication to a certain extent. Perhaps you're listening to someone speak a foreign language, and maybe you've studied this language a little bit, but you're nowhere close to being uh, fluid in this language. And so maybe as you're listening to someone talk, you might misunderstand what they're saying. Or maybe you try to speak a foreign language. And again, you're not fluent in it. And so you try to say one thing, but then you end up saying a totally other thing, a totally different thing. So maybe you were trying to say in a different language, you look lovely today. But by mistake, you ended up saying, you look like a toilet today. Like I said, foreign languages certainly complicate things. Um, having so many different languages uh, prohibits communication and understanding to a certain extent. And I should know a thing or two about that uh, because I've had to study several different languages uh, in order to be a pastor. But it really goes all, for me, it goes all the way back to second grade. My second grade teacher was Hispanic. And every Friday, she would teach us a lesson, uh, a, a Spanish lesson. And then we were to complete a worksheet based on the lesson that she taught. Well, guess who was the last one done? All the time. Me. Without fail, I was always the last one done because I always struggled with it. And then fast forward to high school. Um, by, by the time I was in high school, I kind of had a feeling that I wanted to become a pastor. And so I decided to study German since so much of our Lutheran heritage is German after all. Well, German won my freshman year, went so bad that uh, I had to take German one again my sophomore year. I wish I was making that up. Um, but anyway, I, so I studied German all throughout my years in high school. Um, and then college. I enrolled at Martin Luther College, which is where our synod trains its pastors and teachers. And of course, being a pastor, you have to study some languages. You have to study the two biblical languages, and then they also make you study one non-biblical language. And so I thought to myself, you know what? I'm already going to have to study two new languages. So for my non-biblical language, let's just stick with what I know. Let's stick with German. Well, before the first day of classes started, I had to take a placement exam to, so they could see which class they would place me in. Well, guess where I ended up? Yeah, that's right. I had to take German 1 again for the third time. Ugh, like I said, foreign languages have never been my forte. And then, of course, I had to study the two biblical languages, Greek which is the language of the New Testament, and then Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament. And let's just say I survived. <laughs> let's just leave it at that. I'm just glad there's more to being a pastor than just knowing Greek and Hebrew. And so whenever we go through the events, or whenever I study the events of the Tower of Babel, it, it always leaves a, a bit of a sour taste in my mouth. Because I often think to myself, you know what? If the events at the Tower of Babel never happened, my life would be so much easier. I wouldn't have had to study all these foreign languages. But nonetheless, here we are, 7,000 plus languages later, all because of the events at the Tower of Babel. But there's so much more to this story than just the confusing of the languages and the consequential spreading out of people. As we take a deeper look, into the Tower of Babel, we get a real good glimpse inside the sinful human heart. But we also see God's solution to the sinful human heart. So that's what we'll look at today. But before we look at the events of the Tower of Babel, we need to go back in time even further than, than Babel. Uh, we have to go back to the time of Noah. Now, perhaps you remember, uh, God had Noah build an ark and Noah's family and many animals went on the ark because God sent a universal flood to destroy the whole world because of the vast wickedness that was taking over. Now, that flood, while it certainly was an act of God's judgment, it was also an act of God's mercy. Because had God done nothing, 
if God allowed evil to continue and to grow in the world at that time, then we are most likely looking at universal unbelief, which would eventually lead to universal damnation. And so by preserving Noah, not only is God preserving righteousness and the family of believers, but he's also preserving the promise of the Savior. So God sending the flood was definitely an act of judgment, but it was also an act of mercy and grace. Now, after the flood had happened and Noah stepped off the ark, there was only eight people left in the world. You had Noah, his wife, and they had three sons, and each one of them had a wife. That's eight people in all. And you had a big old empty world with only eight people. And, and so God gave Noah and his family this command. Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. And Noah's descendants did just that. Well, sort of. They definitely increased in number, but they didn't necessarily fill the earth. You see, they all decided to be centrally located and leave the rest of God's beautiful world empty. They all lived in one place. Now, we can certainly understand how they would want to live in a fertile place where they would be very successful. And, and that, that is where they lived. They lived in a very uh, uh, fertile land where they would be successful. And again, we can appreciate that. But they had total disregard to God's command to fill the earth. Um, while these descendants of Noah certainly spoke the same language as Noah, they certainly did not have the same heart as Noah. Because Noah was a, a man who followed God's commands to a T. Noah's descendants, not so much. And we, we get a, a better glimpse of that when we hear of their plan in verse 4 of our lesson, where they said to one another, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Now, there's nothing wrong with building cities and towers, obviously, but the motivation that they had was all wrong, and it was twofold. First off, they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. So instead of doing all things to the glory of God, they were doing this for the glory of themselves. They wanted their legacies to live on in a godlike fashion. And dare I say it, they really were trying to elevate themselves to become godlike. And that is a major first commandment issue. You shall have no other gods. But then the other issue is this, right? They said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Well, that's exactly what God wanted them to do, and they refused to do it. And so they came up with this plan, and, and they thought that they were able to prevent from God's will, uh, or excuse me, they, were, they thought that they would be able to prevent God's will from being done. But as Psalm 2 says, the one enthroned in heaven laughs, the Lord scoffs at them. Why could the Lord scoff and laugh at their plan? Well, it's because he's God. Nothing is going to stop his will from being done. He is going to do what he wants to do. But besides all that, God still cared for these people, and he was very concerned about the direction they were going. And God mentions why in verse 6. He said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Why is that a big deal? Well, because when people develop a godlike complex about themselves, then they forget about the great need that they have for God. And then that eventually leads to having no need for God whatsoever, which then leads to damnation and hell forever. So that's why, that's why their thought process was so dangerous. And that's why God intervened, so that he could save them from themselves. And how did he do that? 
Well, God said, come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. Let us go down. That's a conversation between the three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we're going to celebrate that festival, uh, the festival of Holy Trinity next week. But that's, that's for another day. Uh, but yeah, that's what God did. He confused the languages of the world. All of a sudden, people start talking, and now they cannot understand each other. And so now they had to stop everything. They had to stop building the city and stop building the tower. And that's why that finish, unfinished uh, tower and city was called Babel, because everyone was babbling on and no one could understand each other. So because of what God did, God's judgment now forced the people to spread out, fill the earth, and, and live with people that they could understand and trust. And that's why they, they now had to submit to God's will. God's judgment caused these people to understand that they are not invincible. They are not godlike whatsoever. They now had to realize that there was a force greater than themselves, and they had to submit to his will. And look at what their sin brought about. Their sin brought about separation. Separation from each other, but it further divided them from God. And that's exactly what sin does. Sin separates. Sin separates us from God. Sin separates us from God's people. And yet that's what we continue to gravitate to all the time. And that's why this lesson gives us such a good glimpse into the sinful human heart. Because when you really think about it, we're not all that different from the people at Babel. Because just like they did, we totally disregard what God's will is, and we choose to do our own thing. Even though God's commands are very clear to us, we totally disregard it and choose to do our thing. We choose to accomplish our will instead. Yes, Lord, I know you want me to be in worship regularly, but I have so many things going on. I got weekend sports tournaments. I've got my cabin up north. I need to catch up on my sleep. Yes, Lord, I know you want me to pray for our leaders, but quite frankly, our leaders are just dumb and some of them are just plain evil. How could I pray for people like that? Yes, Lord, I, I know that you want me to save sex for marriage, but I mean, it, everybody's doing it and we're not hurting anybody else. So what's the big deal? It's private anyway. You see, we're not all that different from the people of Babel, are we? We know what God's commands are. We know what God's word says, and yet we disregard it all the time. And every time we disregard God's word, we are doing just what the people of Babel did. We are elevating ourselves to be God-like figures, and we are pushing aside the true God. As a result of our sinful, selfish desires, we are further separated from God. And our sinful, selfish desires can even lead to separation from God's people. But just like the flood was also an act of judgment as well as mercy, so also God's acting here at the Tower of Babel, his actions were also an act of judgment and of mercy. Like I said earlier, by doing what he did, God saved the tower, or God saved the people at Babel from themselves. And he forced them to realize that they are not God-like figures and that they had to submit to his will. Well, in a similar way, God has saved us from ourselves, but he didn't do it by causing separation, but rather he brought about the great unifier, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And when Jesus lived on this earth, he brought people together. It didn't matter what region they came from. It didn't matter what the color of their skin was. It didn't matter what they did for a living. And it sure didn't matter what language they spoke. Jesus brought people together through the proclamation of the gospel. And Jesus brings us together too. He has also saved us from ourselves. Just like God saved the people of Babel from themselves, so also Jesus saves us from ourselves too. 
and he saved us by doing what we often don't do, submitting to God's will. He did it all the time, even if that included suffering and death on the cross, shedding his holy innocent blood, and taking on the punishment for the whole world's sins. He submitted to his Father's will. And yes, his Father's will also included victory. Victory in the form of him rising from his own grave. And so because of Jesus, our sins are forgiven. We are going to heaven. And our relationship with God is fixed. We are united with God once again. And we are also united with one another as well. And it doesn't matter what language you speak. doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what you do. Because through Jesus, through the proclamation of the gospel, we are united. We are one. And that's one of the great truths that we celebrate on this, the festival of Pentecost. When God sent his Holy Spirit to the apostles on that Pentecost day almost 2,000 years ago, God united the people of the world once again through the proclamation of the gospel. Whereas the sin at Babel separated people, the proclamation of the gospel brought people together. And so I guess you could say that in a way, God kind of undid the damage or separation that happened at Babel. And it was fixed, so to say, on the day of Pentecost. And it, what brings us together, again, is that proclamation of the gospel. And that gospel continues to unite us. Now, sure, the, the many languages of the world still exist. But the gospel that unites us supersedes all of that. And so I pray that we would continue to submit to God's will out of love and thanksgiving and that we would continue to rejoice in the unity that we have in the gospel. Amen. The peace of God, which goes beyond our understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord until life everlasting. Amen. We'll now confess our one true Christian faith by using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let, let us pray. Blessed and gracious Holy Spirit, Lord and giver of life, you proceed from the Father and the Son, and together with the Father and the Son, we worship and glorify you. On this holy day, so soon after our Lord ascended to his throne in glory, you descended among his joyous followers with the holy wind and igniting fire. You opened their eyes to see the clarity and completeness of the good news, just as Jesus promised you would. You ratified their ministry in the sight of the nations and conferred on them gifts and courage, to be witnesses to the ends of the earth, as Jesus called them to be. Pour out your power on us again, dear Holy Spirit, and ignite our minds and our hearts to find our purpose in proclaiming the message of Christ. When success seems scarce, console us with the gentle, quiet whisper of your word. When some will listen, open our lips to speak the truth in love. When enemies attack, defend us, 
not with the edge of a sword, but with the power of the gospel. What we pray for ourselves, we pray for your whole church, and especially for those who go in our stead to many places around the world. Guide us deeper every day into the mysteries of Christ and enlarge our grasp of his will and ways. Provide insights to those who teach your word to others that they may expound your truth carefully and precisely. Bless our schools as they prepare men and women to preach, teach, and model your love. Breathe into the hearts of those enduring serious afflictions, stubborn pain, and wrenching doubt, and renew them with your power. Bless especially Beverly Faust, who had a serious fall and, and, infl and was inflicted with injury. We ask that you would bless her a full and speedy recovery according to your goodwill. According to your design, dear Lord, grant to us another Pentecostal harvest that multitudes from every nation, tribe, people, and language may join the assembly of the church to worship you and give you glory. Come, Holy Spirit, renew the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in us the fire of your love. Amen. We'll now join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thanks for taking the time to worship with us today. Again, I apologize for the technical difficulties uh, that we had earlier this week, so we were not able to uh, record our normal worship services, but uh, we are working on that, and uh, Lord willing, we should be up and running next week for the Festival of Holy Trinity. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, Pastor Wayne Chevy from Wisconsin Lutheran College will be our guest preacher then. Uh, also a reminder that we are uh, just beginning our normal summer schedule for the first time in three years. So we still have our Thursday evening service at 6.30, uh, followed by the one Sunday service at 9 a.m. And uh, we will be having special fellowship times after the worship service with coffee and a whole bunch of goodies. So hopefully uh, you can stick around and join us um, and uh, hang out with your Christian family here at St. Paul's. We'd love to have you. Uh, so hopefully this time in God's word was a blessing to you. I pray for God's richest blessings on you and uh, may God be with you till we meet again.